Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. Um, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping because this is a, a full hall, so we've got to be careful. Um, there's the exit before you came in through, and there's also an emergency exit um, at the back of the hall, which is off to my end. Um, there's toilets also on the back wall there to the left, and there's a kitchen and a, a galley hatch, and we are serving.
reason you've got these cards is going to become abundantly clear. So don't throw them away, hang on to them, and we'll hopefully collect as many as we can up from you later on with your inputs on what topics you think are most important. What I'm going to do now is hand over to two colleagues who are from Windrush Against Sewage Pollution. There's Ash Smith here, and then there's his uh, other colleague, Professor Peter Hammond. Um, they've been remarkably successful in terms of raising the profile of sewage pollution um, in the Windrush, um, in local, river, uh, local rivers and streams, but also, I think, nationally as well. And uh, you've probably seen articles in the national press, you've seen uh, um, them on radio, on television, so I think uh, Ash's investigative skills, he was the next policeman, I believe, and um, the data crunching and interrogation from Peter, um, Peter Hammond have worked really well together. So I'm going to hand over to them, and then about 55 minutes, half an hour each, um, then we're going to have a short 10 minute um, points of clarification, really. Keep your big questions and keep your big issues to the second part of the programme. So we just follow up with any points of clarification that you want to ask either of the two. Okay, so that's that. Maybe we can do our swap over now? I hope. Over to you, Ash. Okay, that's my volume at the back. Okay. <laughs> can we turn the lights down then? <laughs> Annie, um, just get behind the curtain. Circumstances that we were told that it was discharged in to improve the effluent standards because 24 hours a day, seven days a week, most sewage works are churning out treated effluent, which should be in the blurb in the OFWA uh, website, the water company's website, should be like clean water. We'll come to that a bit later on. And we want to make rivers safe for all. So, we're, okay, we're, we like that wild swimming thing, that's really important, but we think also the little bugs that make up the the food for the birds that have got their own lives anyway are all vitally part, a part of the biodiversity. So we're about clean water, not, not water with chlorine in it, water that things can live in. So our strategy is based around investigation, which is uh, widespread. And, and part of what I'm saying today is a little bit of recruitment going on here because I know there's a lot of talent in this room and uh, people that will do things. So. That's, that's the underlying message as well. Communication and education, that kind of through the media, but we also do education in various different ways. And we'll do school assemblies, but I just wish you could do them a little bit later in the day. But I'll, I'll, I will go out and do them and some other uh, people. And sit down in front of a whole bunch of blank faces and uh, pretend that they, they, uh, they're interested. I think it gets through, who knows? Engagement, and that engagement is with local councillors, government nationally, the water industry, uh, who are, we're lucky, we're lucky. Thames Water, we will give them definitely a challenging time, but they do, they do talk to us, they're here now, they will listen, and they will obey the law at least some of the time. So that, that, is, and that is much better than, it's, than it is in, in other areas. Believe me. And that engagement with, with local councillors is really picking up now. 
Uh, there are some councillors in this room that are really moving things on as we'll, we'll come to later. And we're also starting to use the law. Some of that law is around planning, but we're, we're talking to various lawyers about how the law might do something where government won't. That's mm -hmm. Barrington Sewage Out Hall. If you, if you live here, that's down to Shieldbrook. If you walk down uh, to <coughs> Liverpool Park towards the, the garden yeah. centre, it's on your right. You might be able to smell it sometimes, mm -hmm. and you will be able to see it. And we'll come to that. Uh, um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about what WASP does, about what's happening in terms of uh, the, the big steps forward, like, like uh, the, the way to use planning to make things uh, speed up, to make investments speed up. Um, I'll try and give you a bit of a broad view of that, and we'll cover the rest of it in the Q&A. And then we'll talk about, uh, I'll hand over to Peter Hammond, to talk about the um, data analysis, particularly Bampton's story, and there'll be a Q&A. And then, if we get to it and anybody remembers, we might answer the question of what that is. And there will be a little, Q, a little clue about that along the way as well, so that there's something to stay awake for. So, this is my dog demonstrating something for me. He put that on himself. I was quite pleased with him. So you had two, two options today. You could, you could do nothing, leave it to the Environment Agency, off what Thames Water and the Government. Or you could come to Bampton Village Hall. So, thank you very much. You've made the first step forward. Right. So, the big game-changing thing in this whole debate about sewage pollution and the way that the various campaigners were complaining about things being wrong, justifiably, changed massively when Peter got hold of the analysis and he started to get hold of huge numbers, huge, huge numbers and analyse the, the data to come up with evidence that showed that the water was being polluted not just unfortunately, but also illegally. And that was really when things started to change. And he used artificial intelligence to do that. Don't ask me what that is. I don't know how that worked. I'm struggling just to maintain my own kind of organic intelligence. But he will tell you all about that. And we also, uh, we do the conventional types of uh, investigation that you would think of about measuring water quality, the conventional things like the big nutrients, like phosphate and nitrate, the things that cause too much algae to grow. Algae don't always think of it as being green, it could be that kind of brown filamentous stuff that you see kicking around, choking everything, creating that fine sediment that coats it once golden gravel beds, choking the life out of things. That's, that's a lot of that's behind that. And also the more kind of intuitively horrible effect of ammonia, but we don't see so much of that, although it does exist. We also do that river fire monitoring, people might be interested in this, and that's looking at the invertebrates, and it's a fascinating thing. In some places, and in fact, Bampton is one of the, of the most depleted places. We can actually widen it out into uh, different aspects that interest you. Um, just let me finish by saying that uh, Ash and Peter, you're still most welcome to chip in and contribute, and thank you very much for your two excellent talks. Thank yes, thank you. Thank you, Alison. So, um, we need to keep the time fairly uh, tight, if we all want to finish uh, one by one. Um, we're going to do the Q&A around four topics. We'll start with uh, the sewage streams, and then move over to the other topics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite one person uh, to start the q and I'm going to ask, so in this case, through its treatment, I'm going to ask Richard, Richard, Richard A, Ailey, Ailey, Ailey uh, from Thames Water, uh, to whether you want to say anything particular from your perspective about the sewage treatment here in Bampton or about the interactive map that was introduced earlier. Good. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and thank you, uh, Peter, and Pat, for a very fair presentation. There are things that I would pick up on and might have slightly different emphasis, but there was nothing there that was grossly misleading by any uh, measure. And there are groups that we deal with around the country where things are grossly misleading. So to have the kind of level of informed, thoughtful, challenging dialogue that we had with was is, is good for all of us, I don't understand. And I West Oxford District Council for that as well. We have another set of challenging conversations. But in terms of what we're doing, 
Um, Bampton Sewage Works currently, the permit is set at 23 litres a second. That's the amount that has to treat before anything goes into the storm tanks. So we've got a major project there, um, starting next year, which will take from 23 to 36. So that's more than half as big again, and that will make a big difference to, uh, to Bampton. We've also got um, a, a big expansion program at Church Hambra, starting shortly. Uh, we, we're doing an investigation at Carterton, because we're not sure that that site meets it all its permit compliance robustly all the time. Shorthand for saying we think probably sometimes it's failing. I'm sure Peter would say the same thing. The big project to look at what we need to do uh, at, at Carterton. And there are similar examples uh, all across the area. Whitney is a very big project, 15 million pounds being spent at Whitney to get the capacity up from 240 to almost 400. So lots of work going on. We can't do everything at once, but it's a big program and we're making a, a, a pitch to do a lot more in the next five years. And I'm very happy to give people business cards and have conversations about individual works. Come and talk to parish councils, we'll take you around, we'll show you what's happening, we'll answer your questions completely openly. And actually for us, this is all really helpful to have the kind of feedback that we've got going on at the moment. And finally, the EDM map, um, it's a genuine exercise in transparency. It wasn't comfortable when it lit, 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 lit up like a Christmas tree to use uh, Ash's uh, um, phrase at the time. We knew that would happen. We knew it would be launched at uh, January. It was a difficult time, but we thought it was much better to get it started. We committed to doing it by the end of the year, so we've got it out on the 30th of December. We'll keep that going. I know there are people who would like more information on the map. That's absolutely fine, but step by step. We wanted to keep it quite simple to start with. Is it discharging now? Has it discharged in the last 24 hours, or has it not? So the kind of refinements we're looking at is, what's the seven day picture, going back seven days? What's the cumulative total for the year? What are your plans for each of the works? So all of that is in progress at the moment, and talking with our web team, uh, a, a, a digital team, and trying to make sure we've got more information here. But at the moment, we have actually gone out, and again, it's prompting some really useful conversation. So that's all I'll take up the time, but say, I'll stay on afterwards, I'm happy to make my okay. speech otherwise. Thank you. Has anyone else got any specific questions for Richard on what he's just said? Yes. <coughs> They spend time coming around the sewage works, they ask us questions, we know them, we know their offices. Uh, there are other MPs where it's a bit more transactional. Uh, they ask us a question, we send them an answer. But I'm sorry, I can't get into discussing relations with individual MPs. But that is quite important, you know that. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say what no, I think. That's a front state constructive with this. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be commenting on <coughs> but can, can you clarify for me? Just from my purpose, yeah. what was said about sewage dumping for the next 15 years. What does yeah. that mean in the context of what we've heard right. earlier today? <laughs> what, what happened was that the environment uh, bill, as it then was, was going through its final stages. There was a big push from campaigners, including Windrush Against Sewage Pollution, Rivers Trust, and Angry Trust. And they put something called the, the Wellington Amendment. The Duke of Wellington proposed that in the Castle Laws, and it would have given stronger legal duties to water companies with regard to sewage. And the water industry lobbied publicly in favour of the Wellington Amendment. It's on the record, I can show you what we did, I can show the Water UK press release. And despite the water, the water industry being in favour, the campaigners being in favour, probably every right-minded minded person in the country being in favour, the government voted it down. And I still don't understand why. Okay, well thank you for that. Yeah, so we'll, uh, that. we'll probably develop that uh, theme because I'm sure that other uh, contributors will want to contribute. Um, we've got limited time, but we've got another couple of minutes on sewage treatment. Has anyone else got a, any questions that they would like to ask about the effect of sewage treatment either in Bampton or in the other parts of the catchment areas that we're talking about today? What's going to happen um, at Briars Norton there, with all the sewage going down to the High Moor Brook and then coming into the Shill Brook? 
Who would like to answer that question? Is that another question for you, Richard, or is that Ash or Peter? Or? I don't know the detail, but I do know that uh, there's a lot of work going on both at Bryce Norton Pumping Station and in the network that feeds it. And I'm happy to uh, pick up with people afterwards. I mean, some of the West Oxfordshire District Council have asked us about as well. Um, and we have, um, we did actually have the local manager in the Council um, a few weeks ago. So there, there is work going on. Um, it's a difficult area, very low lying. Um, and historically, I know we've caused chaos in that area by, by flooding. But I'm um, happy to pick up the detail and, and put, put you in touch with people who can give you the proper answer to that question. Sorry, I haven't got any information in my head at the moment. Thank you, Richard. Anyone else? One minute, can I say? Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, um, the outflow from um, the sewage works, I think it was Ash mentioned, and one of the people who mentioned, 120% capacity. I was just wondering how that was possible. Can you clarify what did they, they were talking about the, the outflow of, of the, from the sewage works being at sometimes at 120% of capacity. And yes, I was I just wondering how to explain that, shall I? Um, Thank you. The capacity is the minimum flow which the works is required to treat. So I could say to you, or you can achieve a minimum 40 miles per gallon with your car. And you go out, drive it really carefully, you get 45. The same thing can happen in a sewage works. So a really good team, uh, Whitney for instance, 240 litres a second is the permit. They would be legal to be discharging, provided it had rained, at 241. That team, well drilled, well practiced, understanding how important this is to the community, get 260 to 270 day in, day out. And of course that's going to 399. So a lot of it is, you know, clearly you've got to have a kit to do it. If your car's straining to reach 40 miles per gallon, you're not going to get 45. But where we can, the works team will always get more out of the works um, than, than the design capacity. You always want a bit of headroom there. If we haven't got enough headroom, where we have, we'll use it. I just wanted to add that at Church Hanborough, for instance, when we did the machine learning uh, work, you know, for a long time Church Hanborough was spilling at something like 70-80% of the capacity where it should have got to before it spilled. And I've looked more recently, and that's where I got the 120% from. It's now actually not spilling, but it's actually went during a period when you would expect it to spill, it's actually up treating up at the 120% of the capacity level. And I don't know how that's done because as far as I know, Church Hamber has had no fix to it. But Richard might know something's happened there. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know people are trying very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was one other question before we move on from this, this topic. Anyone else? Um, just a quick one. I guess it's also to you, Richard. I mean, it's, um, it's encouraging hearing about the um, investment and the expansion plans that you've got for the sewage treatment works. But I wondered if uh, you could say something about other aspects of trying to sort of manage water use and um, also manage leakage and uh, yeah, infiltration to the sewer system. So, in fact, you get less um, going to the sewage treatment works. What other measures, apart from pouring concrete and expanding the treatment plants, are you looking at to squeeze more from the system? So if you've got a switch work that isn't it meeting its, its, its standards, there's three things you can do. You can make it bigger, okay? If you make it bigger, that's, that's fine up to a point. But it means it's operating inefficiently most of the time. You might be flying a minibus and drive the station every morning on the grounds they want to bring friends home for a party once a month. You know, wasted capacity. So you don't want to build it too big. It's also very efficient in terms of energy creation, all things. You want a nice, tightly run sewage works and concentrated sewage. Second thing is you can build bigger storm tanks. Storm tanks is just pouring concrete, and you can do that. And you can fill your storm tanks. But can you ever get them empty? Because unless you get empty quickly, the sewage goes back and septic and horrible. The storm tanks are a short-term storage. If you've got flows coming in that are high, day after day after day, then you can build more and more storm tanks and you can just fill them all. So you have to build your storm tank capacity in parallel with the treatment capacity. Whitney's always had oversized storm tanks to try and help with the infiltration. But now the treatment capacity is, catch is catching up. The third thing you can do, if you want to do, is deal with the problem at source and keep the rain out of the sewers. Because the problem isn't that people are flushing the toilet more when it rains, 
is the rain's getting into the sewers. But, but how and where is it getting in? Now, Whitney, as an example I know well, there are 18,000 homes connected to Whitney Sewage Treatment Works, 45,000 people. It's got 200 miles of sewers. So when you start saying, right, go and find the infiltration, where is it getting in? You've got 200 miles of sewers to look at. And the other thing is, you can only find the infiltration when it's happening. In a dry year, you can look every day of the year, and you won't find any infiltration. And then, when it's really, really wet, the pipes are full. So again, you won't see anything, because the camera can't pick anything up. So there's quite a narrow window of opportunity to find the infiltration that flows up and goes down. The other thing is, in this area, we have a separated foul sewage and surface water. So what comes out of your house, toilets, baths, sinks, washing machines, dishwashers, goes into a foul sewer, and that comes from the sewage flow. We've got a surface water sewer, which is much, much bigger. And that's collecting what comes off the roofs, off, off, off the roads, running, running, down, running down the street. Fine. Until the two get themselves mixed. So if you've got uh, a dodgy plumber or a DIY builder who decides to connect up the foul sewer to the, to the surface water sewer, either you get sewage in your, in your surface water sewer, which is going straight to the river, really, really bad, or you've got loads and loads of surface water taking up capacity in the foul sewer, which again, you don't want, because it either overflows on the way to the works, as happens at Bryce Norton, or it gets to the works, the works gets overloaded. So we have to be working, and we've been doing some work with WASP around Baltimore Water, trying to find where this is happening. And it's not easy. We have to just keep on, keep on going with that. And then we have instances where um, uh, somebody has wanted to drain a corner of a field. Why wouldn't you? You want to grow, grow, grow more crops, and there's a nice pipe going past. Why wouldn't you just knock a hole in that pipe and connect it from your field into there? If that's, a, if that's a foul sewer, it's going to take the team probably weeks to work out what's going on. And then we have dodgy developers. So the developer themselves goes in and gets, gets the building control permission. Nice plans, all very, very neat and tidy. Then they subcontract the drainage work. And they may subcontract it again, and we've, we've seen this happening. And the person who gets the eventual job doesn't do what the plans say. They connect the foul, they connect, connect it all up to the nearest sewer. And if that's the foul sewer, it's, it takes probably the next, to, to the next time we have really wet weather, and the pumping station team saying, what's going on? I mean, we've never had this much flow before. So, you know, all of this needs to be looked at, but this, <coughs> this, that, that's a short answer to the one infiltration. Just one final bit of context, and that is to say the value of, of people power and the pressure that yeah. you're putting on makes a massive difference. The problems at Whitney, we've got documentary evidence that they were first known about in 1996. We know they were then again discussed in 2014. It's now that they're getting the action, and it's about people like you getting behind the idea and, and pushing and allowing the money to go to the people working for the water companies to do their job well. Thank you. So. Let's move on, if we can, uh, to flood management. And I'd like to ask uh, Steve if you could just say a few words about the flood protection group, just to make sure that yeah. the room is aware of that. So, yeah. um, I'm Steve McCarran, I'm a member of Buckingham Parish Council. I'm not here on their behalf tonight, I'm on behalf of the prevention group which I'm a secretary. Um, this group was formed uh, just after 2007, after the Great Flood, which many of you know about, um, when Bumpton got flooded very badly, people were out of their houses for quite a considerable time. It represent, the representatives are from Aston, Bampton, Blackburn, Bryson, and Canfield, and I think we may even get, get the short to join us after the night, because they, they, they're obviously important to us, because that's where the water comes from. We meet with West Oxford District Council, Oxford County Council, Thames Water and Environment Agency. Now, I, I did advertise this meeting to both Thames Water and the Environment Agency. I know we've got a Thames Water rep here. I'm not sure there's anybody at the Environment Agency. They said they, they wouldn't be able to come. So that may, may, may tell you something, I don't know. Uh, we meet two or three times a year. Our next meeting is to, in fact, tomorrow. Uh, we're principally interested in flooding, not, not in sewage, because, uh, it, it, because, because of what, why we were set up. We look after the, strip, the rivers, streams, ditches, and other drainage systems in the village uh, and in the area. Um, we get reports from the agencies, um, and we are able to raise our concerns about flooding in the area. Uh, the 
The viral agents, as you know, expect our streams, and they clear blockages, i.e. with riparian owners, if there are trees in the river which are causing flow problems, possible flooding, then they will deal with that, and they are dealing with that. Um, we've had some successes over the year, since this group has started, uh, with the previous chairman and also some of the public group, we got these ponds built at Chilton, which in fact stopped the water coming down into Bampton, now, now, and so we, we haven't had any flooding since 2007. It's got pretty close, I think not, not this winter, the winter before we had rain for about two months. It got just up to the pathways, it didn't get into the houses. Another success was we actually got people to, uh, we got uh, flood doors put in for people so they, their houses are protected. And um, we also helped with getting insurance because that was one of the big issue when people were flooded, they couldn't be insured. Uh, uh, or insurance company would be reluctant to, to insure them, but that, that was, uh, pressure was put on by us. The, the only issue about sewerage is, we know that in, in Clanfield, the, the Thames Water did some work to line some sewers there, and in fact that was quite successful to start with, until the recent rain. And apparently, recently, the, the groundwater just got back into the system again, and I know, I know we've had some sewage in the, uh, out into the, um, into the uh, ditches and streams. Um, I'm pleased to hear that Bampton, uh, we're, we're very pleased to hear that Bampton Sewage Works is going to be upgraded. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that, that's another uh, bit of good news, I suppose. But um, that's all I really wanted to say about it. If anybody wants to um, access our information, if they can contact me through Alistair, I can keep people informed of what we're doing as far, as far as the committee is concerned. We do hold Thames Water and the VA to, to the fire feet to the fire every about two or three times a year so we, we ask further questions about uh, what they're doing to make sure that we aren't flooded and uh, clearly sewage we have had some sewage flooding in Bampton we had some backup um, due to water ingress on New Road uh, and we got uh, West Oxford EA and Thames Water to come along and do something about it they actually found that the sewer was actually blocked in there that particular instance and it flooded back onto the road and into the ditches so uh, we're, we're uh, Keep them, keep them uh, on, uh, on, uh, on their touch. Thank you. Has anyone got <coughs> one question? I'll take one question for Steve on flooding. Yes. Uh, on the the EA are helping you in Bampton. They aren't helping us in Aston, and actually, most of the water from the parishes around here flows into Aston before it goes into the Thames. We have a flooding problem. The EA do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Right, well, I mean, Paul, who was representative from, uh, from uh, Aston, I'll, I'll mention that to you. I have mentioned it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Trevor, did you want to say anything quickly about that? Well, uh, the trouble with the environment agency is underfunded and the morale is abysmal. Um, we discovered in our own application or fighting the planning down the uh, Aston Road. What I don't like, and I wish planners uh, would. The environment agency produces flood zone maps. Flood zone maps record flooding from rivers and watercourses. It does not cover what happened to this stage in 2007, which was run of flooding. And if you're a householder standing in a foot of water in your kitchen, it's no great sort of comfort to be told, oh, well, this wasn't uh, pluvial flooding. This was, and and I, I think that um, developers always look at the flood zone mapping of, of Bampton. The other thing, the environment agency, that they, they record this detail on a historical basis. And of course, people are likely to say, yes, my house was flooded, but a farmer is unlikely to say, my field was flooded. So of course, there's great gaps in this mapping as, as it stands. And I think, you know, unfortunately, I'm wondering whether planners um, entirely appreciate that. Okay. Uh, but we'll come back to that. And um, one minute. Um, Charlie, did you want to say something about flood natural flood management? Just sure. a very end sure. concept, just literally for okay. the <coughs> um, Just So so I'm a district councillor, a new one, uh, for Stanley Essen, Stanton Harcourt. Um, and, and I spent most of my time with Alaric and Lydia grappling with Thames Water and Richard, and I'm very grateful for his engagement in that grapple. Um, uh, flooding is getting worse. So the Environment Agency data at Newbridge at the bottom of the Windrush, um, if you look at that data, flooding it has got worse by frequency and by severity, very markedly. 
Um, obviously, 2007, 2014, and 2019, and 2020 are, are obvious ones there. And that obviously impacts us in Bampton, Aston, Stanley, Lake, Aston, uh, Aston, Southern Harbour, etc. But also, obviously, Whitney. Um, and uh, you know, a guy died in Whitney a few years back from, from flooding. So it's, it, it, it is life and limb that we're talking about. Um, so, so that's kind of the scale of the problem we're dealing with. Um, flood control is not working. So um, taking three agencies, county council, district council, and environment agency, up until um, now, and we are hoping to get a signature in the next month, there's been a fluffy verbal agreement between the lead local flood authority, which is the county council and the district council, and nothing ever written down. And we're trying to get that written down so it's very clear as to who between the county and the district is responsible. So that's one thing. The second thing, and probably the worst criminal, um, is the environment agency. The environment agency is failing us in many, many ways. Um, one of those ways, as Trevor just said, is the flood maps. So the moors in Ducklington, some of you may know, the, the district council turned down 120 houses. We couldn't turn it down officially on flooding, even though it's a lake, you know, multiple times, because the EA and their wisdom moved it out of flood zone three, which is the worst site, into flood zone one, and therefore we are not allowed to claim it as, as flood zone, even though everybody knows it was, and the flooding's getting worse as, a, as per the EA data. So that's one way that EA is failing us. Another way they're failing us is there's three people, three, in charge of flood control between Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire, and Berkshire. Three people, yeah? And then on top of that, you have something called ordinary water courses, which is your, your average ditch, and main rivers, which you would have thought would be the even over the windrush, but no, it's not. It's your average ditch as well. And if you go onto the EA uh, flood map, you can look at main rivers, which is a network, particularly around places like Northmore, of ditches. And every time you want to do anything in any of those ditches, you need an EA permit. And even the EA people do not know which permit you need to apply for. And they issued five permits in all of West Oxfordshire in the last year. I'll be there in a moment. So where should we head for? We need to, um, we need to lower that flood crest coming through Whitney, which is an enormous job. And it's not something that's going to happen in a year. But what we need to be doing, and the even low catchment partnership, which Thames Water has partly funded to a significant degree, is something we should be replicating, thank you, Debbie and Annie, um, in, <coughs> on the Windrush. And that, that's a big long term goal, but it's something that can be done, it's something we need to work towards. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to move on to planning and the river environment. So I'd like to ask Allery to say a bit more about the ground condition in relation to particularly in this area. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Aaron Smith, I'm uh, the new district councillor from Maine. Um, and as Charlie just said, uh, we've been working very closely uh, with Thames Water over the last sorry, I'll speak up, up, sorry, I'll speak up. over the, the last um, year or nearly a year. Um, so we've had regular monthly meetings and we've also been talking to our, our sort of senior planners about all this. One of the, basically the, the point about the grandfather condition is that we, it's, it's obviously the case that if you put 100 more houses down then there's going to be that much more sewage to be, to be dealt with. There needs to be extra capacity put into the system and we know from what we've already heard that the capacity isn't there, that it's already, um, it's already sort of overflowing. So effectively what the grandfather condition does is it says that the houses, and it's worded this way because we think this is the, the most sort of legally robust way of doing it, although we're going to take further advice on that, but it basically says that the houses cannot be occupied until the, um, the infrastructure has been upgraded to, to provide the, the capacity. Um, that sort of ties in with something that we've done uh, in terms of the way that the developers have to apply for their planning consent. So we have a pre-application checklist that went live uh, at the beginning of this month um, where a sewage capacity statement is now required from developers uh, uh, which requires them to have discussed the adequacy of the sewage treatment and, and sewer capacity with Thames Water in advance. Where it's inadequate, there needs to be an agreed plan as to how it's going to be addressed. 
Um, that goes through the pre-planning service of Tender Water, I understand, who have said that they're going to stand by what they commit to for a minimum of a year. Um, and that basically means that, therefore, that we can impose a grounding condition in, in a sensible way. We know what it is that is required, um, that, that can be put down in the planning consent, and that therefore means that the, you know, the, the buildings can't actually be occupied, and therefore the pressure on the system can't be intensified until that work has been done. Um, before you sit down, is there any questions specifically for Alaric on the Grampian condition? Yes, Jen. How is it enforced? Because we hear again and again, um, rules are open, and nothing happens. Be violated, etc. So how is the Grampian condition really enforced? Well, it's obviously it's um, it would be planning enforcement that would that would need to look at that, and the. You know, effectively, what um, we would be doing there you know, would be preventing people from you know, being able to occupy the houses. What, what, the, one of the ways that we want to do it is you know, we want to make it widely known that, this, that these government conditions are going to be um, imposed. Because in the end, it comes down to um, you know, it comes down to lawyers not allowing you know, people to buy a house that have a government condition that hasn't been satisfied. So, you know, indeed, and, and we're just going to have to, you know, do our best to work with that. But, you know, yeah. we are where we are. I think this yeah. comes to the community yeah. uh, engagement. Thank you very much, uh, um, Annie and Debbie. Do you want to say something about the river environment and about community engagement? Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, the river is obviously about the river channel, the water, the water quality, etc. Um, but we've got the surrounding lands, which is really part of the river environment and very much impacts the river environment. Um, we love our rivers. They're a fantastic habitat for sort of the creatures and life and plants that we love as well. Um, the richest part of our sort of whole environment, really. Um, the environment that we see today, we see lovely things, uh, egrets, we've got some water bowls, um, some nice sort of wet meadows and things. But that's a very degraded environment to what our uh, grandparents uh, or previous generations have been familiar with. We see, in terms of sort of the, the natural plants and wildlife, just a real fragment of what, what there should be. And this sort of degradation that we, we're sort of witnessing is very much, um, it's, uh, sorry. Um, it's very time critical. We've got a bit of a balancing thing. People say, well, let's fix it quickly and it will all bounce back as it was. But you know the ecology is so sort of such a sensitive and complex system that we really do need to look at sort of acting quickly. And it's very commendable the work of WASP and challenging water companies, etc. But this requires big infrastructure change from their point of view, and there's not going to be any sort of quick fix solution there. We could be talking about years or decades. Um, so this is where we come in, community. Um, thank you for the great turnout, it's brilliant. Well done, Bounty, and uh, I know there's other villagers here, Kathy, <laughs> and others. Um, we have a great resource in this room. We have a huge number of skills and people who may be willing to help. So I'd like you to ask a question. How am I going to respond to this situation that we've heard about today? <coughs> we've got two choices actually. We either say, yes, we're going to do something about it, or we say, no, we're not. But what's at stake? It's not just um, for ourselves. You know, we have children, there will be grandchildren, the, the ongoing generations. What do we want to hand down to these? Uh, you know, the future generations. We have a big responsibility here. 
Um, so Paul, you're, you've got some ideas about how people might <coughs> Well, when we get to the action cards, we can In have that. We can move there now. Do you want to go there? Uh, yeah, I, I just talk about community engagement. Debbie, if you stand up, she's. <laughs> <laughs> What the, it's about what the community wants to achieve, you know, what issues we want to address. It could be the flooding, the habitat, the water quality, however we do it. Um, and what Debbie and I are doing is sort of already gathering sort of groups of people, not, not on such a scale as this, but we've got a small volunteer group in Shilton, Andrews here somewhere. Um, we've got a we're meeting with a group we've set up in Crawley. Um, we're doing some water yeah, monitoring yeah, training and testing. First day. Yeah. We've got something lining up for the Barringtons. Um, and we're also going to start to focus high up in the sort of Guyton's, Norton's at the top of the Windrush. Um, what we really want to see is communities gathering looking after their own patch, which is what people love to do. And then joining them up in a sort of contiguous sense to start to sort of um, address the issues on more of a sort of river basin scale because you can't fix your bit of the river if the river sort of at the top is broken. Um, that's not my office, so I'm going to be short of time. So, what is going to go on and talk about? Well, I think that oh, I think we just want to take forward in terms of community engagement. We'd like you to leave because we're coming to the end of the evening. And thank you very much for your questions and for listening. Uh, and uh, Alistair will close in a moment. But before he does that, uh, you've, on your way in, you've all given a, a green form uh, to, to, on which we'd like you to write, if you would wish to, to write your name and email address, identify which of those, if any, or write another one you'd like to get involved in. And we will then use that information as and when uh, something comes forward. We, we, we don't yet know. This is a new local rivers network. We're not committing to anything specific, but over the next period, uh, we hope things will start coming together. And some of the ideas for each of those areas, tackling zero pollution, which you might want to know about and get involved in, are on these cards. Can I ask Sarah, can you, can you just put your finger on each of these cards and turn on the computer? <laughs> just so that people can see what the cards look like. Just put a picture of it. Finger on that. That's it. And it is, um, unless sort of proven otherwise, well worth us trying to follow up with a series of next steps and maybe try to establish something like a, a local rivers network and take that forward. Um, if you've got any particular ideas, um, in addition to the four points here, just scribble them on the on this on the back of these cards and let us have that back. Um, before I finish, maybe a little bit of feedback. Anybody like to just make a couple of comments um, on the evening? What you found most interesting? What we haven't covered? Um, what we should do with a follow-up meeting? Any, any particular points? Uh, we won't belabor the point because it's almost nine, but uh, a couple of minutes uh, just to get a little bit of feedback from you. Yes, uh, Dennis. Yes, uh, I, I've always had a sort of curiosity about the ditches around Bampton. You know, who is responsible? Is it the landowners? Is, is it the county council? Is it the uh, district council? Because there are an awful lot of ditches. Some of them are in an absolute dreadful state. Are they an active part of the you know, drainage system, or are they sort of something that kind of from a previous age that you're not really used? It's a grey area, isn't it? Steve, um, can't see this. You know, yeah. Yes, uh, it's a grey area, isn't it? Indeed, <laughs> <laughs> we, we usually work with WODC or OCC on, on, on certain ditches. The ones on the main roads, obviously, that's that's highways, so they, they have to deal with those, and they have to clear out the grips. 
so the water does go off the road into the ditches, it doesn't stay on the road. Um, the ditch we had up a new road, that one got polluted because the sewage <coughs> wasn't going away, it should have done. That, we, we, got, uh, we got WRDC and OCC to come and clear that out, so that's what we deal with normally on the, on the main, on reasonable side ditches in the area. Could I add one comment to that? Yeah. You can look on the EA flood map yeah. and you can zoom in on that and you can see whether it is a main river and if it's not a main river designation, yeah. it could be a ditch but if it's not a main river then it is an ordinary water course and therefore WODC is very likely your first port of call. Right. So it's either EA yeah. or WODC. Well, we do meet with an engineer from WODC every two or three times a year and an OCC engineer as well so they can decide between them whether it stays or not. Yeah. Who's it, who's it belongs to, yeah. Yeah. This year, yeah, well, just a couple of weeks ago, the ditches were all cleared out with one of these big um, mm -hmm. industrial um, agricultural cutting machines. And that seems to be a good job. Yeah. I mean, couldn't that be done every year? Well, that's down to budget. Who, who, who's responsible for that? Yeah. Sorry, who did that? Was that, was that, the, the ditches were cleared just recently which very ones, well. Which ones, in the village? Right round the village, all the village, there was a big machine came round yeah, and yeah. cut the dishes. And it looks It'll be a local farmer that will have done it. Sorry? It will be a local farmer that's done it because the EA and West Oxford well, District it Council it do wasn't, something. It wasn't just, it was everywhere. Yeah, no, well, it's, because it's to do with hedge trimming time of year. Yeah. And while the farmer's got his hedge trimmer on, he'll trim the ditch out because I've done exactly the same. <laughs> all down wheels. Oh, it was, looks well done anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it won't, it won't be anything to do with the EA because they're hopeless, I'm sorry. <laughs> Right. Any more um, particular points to raise apart from ditches? Okay, well, hands up if uh, you're interested in um, developing this network um, and seeing if we can uh, have a more of a dialogue, uh, an organised dialogue in the future. Just raise your hand if you're interested. If you're not, that's uh, 50 50, I should think. Yes. 50